on TV, online and on your smartphone. This is Ticken News. This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. G'day, I'm Chris Judd and this is Talk Your Book and today we're lucky to be joined by Tom Lambeth from VP Capital. Uh, Tom, I say this every time, but you've moved past Hall of Fame status on Talk Your Book and you're now straight into to legend status, so you're like the Lee Matthews of Talkie Book. So thanks very much for, for coming back on. Oh, looking forward to the membership <laughs> in the mail. Um, so maybe before we start, just give us a, a quick overview of VP Capital and, and how you guys look to invest. Yeah, sure. So we're a long short fund and based in Melbourne, but we have a, a global mandate. Um, we're a net long fund, which which means we're, we're always you know biased to be um, invested in the market. Um, so we've been around six years with a, a circa 18% annualised return net of fees. And uh, it's a milestone for, uh, for TalkBook today because it, it is our first uh, short position, I believe. So walk us through the, the stock you want to talk about and, and how you're viewing it. Sure. So this is Temple and Webster. Um, and we're not known for, for being you know, a, a very um, sort of active short fund because we're, we're long short and with a bias of, of being long. But I thought this is one, an interesting one to talk about. It's, it's obviously a, an e-commerce um, you know, to retail. It sells furniture online. Um, one thing I want to point out, sort of point out straight up, is we're not necessarily uh, bearish on the on the business. You know, we're not saying it's going to go to zero. Um, you know, it's a it's an Australian success story, but we think the equity is just overvalued. So it's a, it's a short on valuation grounds only. Which is important to note because there are you know the most famous short sellers. Um, you know, Jim Chanos, uh, some of these American guys will often short things that they think have some fraudulent. Uh, parts of the business. So just to be clear, that's that's not your thesis here. It's just something that you think looks expensive. That's right. And um, so we'll get into what they do in a minute. But psychologically, what's your mindset shorting? Obviously, a short, your gains can be infinite. Um, sorry, your losses can be infinite, as opposed to when you buy a stock, your loss is 100% of your capital. So does that change your psychology and perhaps position sizing? Definitely, it's, it's a psychological struggle, I think, for any, any person um, to get their head around because you know, if you're right, you can make maximum 100% if it goes to zero. And if you're wrong, then as you point out, you can, you can potentially lose um, multiples of your money. Um, and we've seen that happen before in the market. And sometimes it does happen. Um, and often what can happen is you can, you can be a short and be correct on a medium to long-term view um, about the stock but they can you know, lose multiples of their money in the short run because the market just doesn't believe them. So it's, a, it's almost, um, and then there's a risk side of things where you need, to, you need to look at managing risk. And as the position size grows, if you're wrong, then you almost need to cover high, which means you're you know, unfortunately um, you know, buying high and, and, and sort of selling low, which is the opposite of what you want to do in, in markets. Yeah. So. And in terms of, you know, there's a lot of Aussie long short funds that are really long funds and they short into companies that look like they're going to need to play stock at, at a discount. <laughs> this isn't in that category. As a heuristic, outside of limited cash on the balance sheet and stocks look like they come raise, are there patterns in stocks you generally short and, and things that you use as a heuristic to say this may be a, a stock that's, that's a short for us? I think generally, you know, yes, like, and, and checklists are a good thing. Um, you know, there's, there's famous people in the US market and the Australian market that talk about using a checklist to kind of go through and, okay, how many red flags does this sh particular short um, satisfy? I think that's certainly true. Um, you know, for us, it's, it's very situational. So, you know, in, in this case, um, because of the valuation and, you know, because of uh, the particular, you know, macro environment, um, and, and relative value, we just think that, you know, that dwarfs anything else that we may be positive about. Um, so it's all balanced. Yeah. And you, you mentioned valuation a couple of times and the thesis here is based around valuation. So let's start with that. Maybe give us just the, the PE multiple of this stock, what their, their growth rate is for, for revenue. And, and maybe, you know, to me, it looks like a, a stock that's been valued like a tech stock, mm -hmm. but some of the metrics mirror what it actually is and, and more of an online retailer. That's right. So historically, the company's been growing at around 25% per annum, and that's sort of, you know, from that's rev growth. Rev growth, and that's from 2015 to kind of now, 
um, listed in 2015. It was actually founded in, in 2011 as, as a bit of background. And, and so, you know, the VAL now, though, it's always been valued at, at a high multiple, but um, now it's on a, on a PE of sort of close to 200 times, um, about 180 sort of annualised, and then on an EBITDA multiple of, of around 70 times EBITDA. So, you know, it's expensive by, I think, most, you know, fund manager sort of metrics. Um, to give you an idea, it's, it's closest competitor, um, or I guess not competitor, but uh, comparable, is a business called Wayfair, which is its equivalent in the United States. Um, TPW actually bought the Wayfair Australia business about 10 years ago, and so think of it as like a mini Wayfair, and that's on around uh, 15 times EBITDA, um, albeit, you know, lower growth, but, you know, bigger market, more mature. And um, you, do you expect the 25% revenue growth to continue over the next few years? Yeah, and so that yeah, it brings us to the point here. I think, you know, in order to believe, because um, it's okay to be valued at a higher multiple, uh, we're not saying that's, that's wrong uh, necessarily, just on a standalone basis. What we're saying that we're concerned about is 70 times, you know, with 25, if it was growing to 25% in perpetuity, then maybe. Uh, but, you know, to get back to a market multiple, you really need to believe the earnings have to 5x at least, I would have thought. And doing a 5x multiple of earnings in the, in the short to medium term is difficult, particularly with this business model, which we can talk about um, in detail. But, uh, you know, uh, the, answer, the answer is no. And then there's a couple of other data points I'd refer you to. The first is, um, first, you know, 25% per annum um, is, is unusual to sustain. Um, this, the, second, the second point is, you know, the, the furniture e-commerce penetration rates uh, are still at, you know, call it, I mean, they're low. They're in Australia, they're eighteen uh, percent, but they never really go to one hundred percent. You know, books and music, as a great example, um, tends to cap out at sort of fifty percent. And so, in the US, furniture is at thirty percent. So in Australia, it's at eighteen. There is some growth, but it's not. It's not infinite. That's what I'm yeah. saying. And so, TPW might tick along for a while, but I think you know, three to five years down the track, I bet that it's not twenty five percent. And so we'll, we'll, we'll dig a bit deeper into their business model in a sec, but maybe just while, whilst we're on the valuation metrics, just talk us through the state of their, their margin, mm. uh, what that is compared to other tech stocks that attract this sort of valuation, and maybe a little bit about the return on equity and if that's lower than you'd expect or, or hope for a business, um, which has been a, a really high quality business, mm -hmm. albeit at, at lofty valuations. Yes, that's right. So they make around 30% gross margin. And then if you trace down to EBITDA margin, they're left with like a low single digit EBITDA margin. So we call it sub 5%. And then, you know, they, they make very little profit on that. So they've only recently turned profitable because, um, and, if, and if you look at the business model, you know, they're paying 70% to the supplier to manufacture the good, um, you know, whether that's the, the couch or, um, you know, the piece of furniture. And, you know, that's mainly in Asia. That's a variable cost. Um, and then you trace down the P&L and you've got marketing. That's also a variable cost because you need to sustain the, the demand for your platform. Um, you've got employees, which is you know, somewhat of a, a variable cost. I think maybe some of it's fixed, some of it's variable. And then, and so it's, it's really a variable cost business, um, which, which is difficult because, you know, if you need to 5X your earnings um, in order to justify the valuation, then that implies you need to multiply your revenue by just as much in a variable cost business um, because there are no there are no fixed costs really in, in my opinion um, and so and is that the main part of the business model that that makes it problematic on evaluation metric maybe just give us the, the proper helicopter view of of Templin Webster and, and how they go about selling furniture yeah and, and so because you're running a variable cost business um, it just means that it just means that you either need to you know, cut costs or, or you know, basically grow revenue um, in order to justify that, that 70 times EBITDA. And you know, they said they, they may expand um, some, some margins by you know, increasing, um, you know, increasing their, their, their EBITDA margin by cutting, cutting marketing and maybe get some scaling at the employee, employee line. But yeah, we're, we're just sort of skeptical of that. And then you know, to your original point about a return on equity, um, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a low margin business. The company, interestingly, in the last um, last little while have started a buyback and they've bought it back around, um, I think it's a $30 million buyback and maybe they're like two thirds of the way through, which tells you that they don't have an organic 
um, mm. you know, I guess, uh, uh, purpose for that capital. Um, so they're returning it to shareholders, which is another, you know, not a red flag because how can you say uh, buybacks sometimes can be construed as a good thing, but they've got no organic purpose for that capital, which is, which is concerning. Um, the other concern, you know, to, to kind of point to is the focus on M&A in, instead of just organic growth, um, which says to me that management don't necessarily believe in that 25% in, in, in perpetuity. And, and I don't think anyone really believes it, but, you know, except for the market, which, which, is, which has got this pegged at a very high multiple. Um, and then, so you do mention that cash have got on the balance sheet, which is a, a significant amount. And most of your short positions, should you take them up, companies with limited cash on the bank, uh, on, on their balance sheet? Is that sort of one thing here which <clears throat> you can makes you nervous in a sense? Yeah, I, I definitely think, you know, where could I be wrong on, on this? And, um, you know, where could we lose? Where could VP lose money? I, I think it's, um, you're right, they're definitely not come raise, you know, unless they do a big acquisition. Um, hundred million dollars is, is a lot of money, uh, given they're profitable. Um, we, we do look you know, occasionally to short companies that we think could come raise and then, and then obviously cover afterwards once they raise capital. Um, and that can be a nice little trade, but you know, that's also got its you know, dangers because you can, you can be um, shorting and then the company will release a favorable you know, piece of news flow and then raise into that news flow. Mm. So you've just got to be careful. But yeah, in this case, in TPW's case, we're, we're not yeah, we're not shorting because it's, it's come raised at all. And, and we, we could certainly uh, be wrong in, in a number of manner, manners on this. And if I were to take a stab at, you know, what would be the potential headwinds to a short position in this, population growth is one thing that stands out for me. Like 600,000 net population increase in the last 12 months is significant and a big tailwind for, for companies like this. Um, and the unemployment is still so low, mm. uh, whilst cost of living is hurting a lot of people. Timber Webster do have some lower cost offerings in, mm -hmm. in their products. Are they a couple of things that, that you had to get comfortable with before putting this position on? Yeah, well, what I'd say to, to frame this, this view is it's not a long-term short, if that yeah. makes sense. Because the we're, company's performed really well yes. over an extended period. Yes, we're, we're not here, you know, saying we're, we're, we're here forever as a short. This is tactical only and obviously not financial advice, but for us it's tactical. We'll be back with more Talkie Book after this short break. On TV, online, and on your smartphone, this is Ticker News. This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk, and financial solutions. Called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. This is Talk Your Book, and we're with Tom Lambeth from VP Capital. Tom, you were talking uh, a little bit there, and you mentioned a couple of times that this is a tactical short position in Temple and Webster, and not one that you think a long term. A business that's doomed to fail over the longer term, just one that's maybe got ahead of its skis on, on valuation metrics. I just want to dig in to a little bit more around um, what you're in the lookout for to see where you could be wrong. Mm, sure. I think where we could lose money here is if the obviously the broader market ripped, which would be you know probably uh, a, an Australian domestic consumer rebound. Maybe it's rates driven. You know, maybe, maybe the RBA suddenly has a you know, a more dovish stance, um, you know, possibly, possibly the Fed, um, you know, instead of two or three, maybe we get more rate cuts in the next, in the next year or so. Um, Cause that, in a zero interest rate environment, mm. any stock with growth just looks amazing, doesn't it? We saw it historically, the, the companies that did best in that ZERP environment were the ones on huge multiples that, that had some growth. That's right. Yeah. Companies with earnings that were long dated um, yeah. tend to do better. And, and so that's definitely a risk. So you're watching the US 10 year for this trade as something that you think will be highly correlated? I, I think correlated and, and also because this is an Australian business, I think that the earnings will, um, will be driven and the revenue will be driven uh, also by domestic affairs. And so we're watching um, you know, things like um, rates here, consumer sentiment, um, you know, uh, and sort of just a broader sort of the broader macro environment in, in Australia. 
Um, so we, we could definitely be, you know, short term, um, you know, we could be wrong there where everything rips. Um, you know, we, we think that this has rallied hard, this has really doubled in the mm. last it's six months. So it's, it's rallied hard, it's kind of back to, um, you know, almost COVID highs. And so um, we think the probability is low, which is why we're short. Um, and what probability do you put on rate cuts in Australia this calendar year? I think it's unlikely, um, but you know, in, inflation seems to be persistently high. So, so I think you know, everyone has sort of factored that in and it sort of seems unlikely, um, but it's not, you know, nothing certain. And you know, I think it'll be um, also driven by you know, what global uh, you know, federal reserves uh, do um, you know, around the world. And so you've got, that's where you could be wrong. In terms of where you could be right, what milestones are you looking out for in the next three to six months? Uh, or are they just more at, at that macro sort of level? Yeah, I think it's, it's certainly at the, uh, it's had a big run and what, what tends to happen is, you know, shareholders do want to see um, some realisation of value. Um, obviously the CEO has lightened a bit himself as well, selling, you know, 10% of his shares recently. Um, you know, I, I think we're more likely to see just a, a valuation retrace. Um, maybe it's, you know, in line with, with what's going on at the moment, you know, in, in markets. Um, the, the view is you, you never know, you know, sometimes you never know exactly the trigger for what it'll be. Um, but if something is, is asymmetric to the downside, you know, you're, you're better off, you know, having a position um, to the downside. It could be, could be rates, it could be something geopolitical, um, you know, but I wouldn't be long here. Well, you've had plenty of firsts on this show. You've had the first 7 xer and then you've had the first short position. So thanks very much for coming back on the show. Thanks, CJ. This has been Talk Your Book. Thanks very much for watching. Tune in more for next week.